Hello, beautiful listeners. It's your host, Tembi Locke. Welcome to Lifted, a podcast that pulls back the curtain on creativity, resilience, and the extraordinary moments when everything changes. Shannon Baker Davis is an award-winning television and film editor. First 10 years of her career, she worked on unscripted and reality projects, including Emmy-winning shows like Top Chef and Project Runway. Later, she parlayed her skills into the scripted world, working on acclaimed television shows and films such as Insecure, Grownish American Crime Story, The Photograph, and Ava DuVernay's Queen Sugar. She was recently invited to become a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, one of only a few Black female editors to hold that honor. I met Shannon when she joined the editorial team on From Scratch to bring our series to completion. It was a joy to work with her, and she will inspire your thinking about the art of editing, the power of point of view in storytelling, and of course, the balance of motherhood and work. So Shannon, welcome to the Lifted Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) I am so delighted to have you here just to talk and to explore, first of all, you, what you do, your unique lens on the world, right? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. how you bring that to craft. So it's so exciting. You know, we had the pleasure of meeting, well, we worked together before we actually met. I feel like we're together, which is to say on the obituary of Tunde Johnson, you were the brilliant editor of that. And I know, you know, of course, we didn't have a chance to interface on set. But then I remember when I saw the film, my mind broke. Like, in so far as I thought, what am I watching? How is the story assembled? Where is this going? What is it? And it left me on the edge of my seat. And I was in it. I'd read the scripts. Like, I knew what was happening. But I didn't know what was happening. And I thought, who is this person who did this? The editor is brilliant. So <laughs> lo and behold, it's <laughs> Shannon Baker Davis. <laughs> and, you know, then we had a chance to work together on From Scratch. Yeah. So yes. it's lovely. That was a gift. So I want to say I was doing some research and I heard you or I read maybe you describe your work as an editor as the invisible art. Yes. Yes. I thought that was such a beautiful way to describe your work. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Well, we are invisible artists because we serve the film. We serve this television series and you're putting it together in a way so that it feels organic and it doesn't feel like you're watching something that's been worked on for months and months and months. It feels natural. A lot of times people don't even understand that the footage that is shot is edited at all. Oh, they just shoot it that way. They just have cameras up the same way that you would use your own home camera. They just have cameras up on actors and they just record it and it magically is put together. And it's always interesting to talk to people that don't know about editing and almost blows their mind that (laughs) this process happens and that it takes so much time to figure out what the story is and how you put it together and starting as an editor and explaining to people what we do. They were always like, oh, you you just cut out the, the bad takes. That's why it's invisible because people don't even understand that our job is a job. Yes, there's multiple levels to this quote unquote invisibility, right? There's the invisibility yes. of like, okay, general people don't even know that it exists. There's that level of professional invisibility. But then yeah. there's the invisible hand of the editor, which if done well, takes something that wasn't there and makes it there. Like you make the invisible visible. <laughs> if exactly. that it sounds the very craft. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, the craft of it. And and there's, you know, there's schools of thought. There's the school of thought that you should never see and cut. You should never see and edit. You should never understand that the camera has changed position because it should all just flow and feel like it's connected. And one thing is just organically going into the next. And then there's different types of edits where you actually do feel it. And there are places where you do want your audience to feel the change and feel the dynamic of a scene and there are ways to make that happen, you know, and sound is a whole nother element. We just talk about picture, you know, there's a whole other 
process and a whole other team of craftspeople that do intricate sound work to also be invisible or not. Well, that's one of the things I was thinking about. I mean, certainly on From Scratch, I had the first hand experience of really being in an editing bay. I mean, I'd been in an what they call an ADR room where I'm like, you know, matching mm-hmm. as an actor, matching my voice to the picture, blah, blah, which is a yeah. form of post-production. It's a, it's a necessary yes. part of it, but that is not editing. <laughs> and so yes. to sit in the editing bay and watch the way you employ the given narrative, as was scripted, mm-hmm. pace, music, atmosphere, and the art and the craft, symboling all of that, I realized, I was like, oh, this is kind of the final pass at the story. We wrote the story and then we filmed it and that took on another kind of characteristic. There's this final piece, right? Yeah, they call it the final rewrite. You write a story three times. The first time is script. And the second time is in production when the director takes that script and makes it their own. And then the third time is when the director and the editor and the producers work together to do the final rewrite. There's all different types of processes, you know, like some people are beholden to their script. And so you are making that the best that it can be. And some people will absolutely just blow up the original script in the final edit and say, oh, it's a whole new thing now. It's all a process. (laughs) So there's so much I'd love to talk about this. And I guess I want to go back a little bit and think about Yes, how you got here. So yeah, we can talk about the professional path, but really like even earlier than that, Shannon, little girl Shannon, was there some part of you in your early formative years where you were like, oh, I see the world in this way. I mean, was there some young editor in you before you knew you were an editor? I mean, there's always been a writer in me. I've always just gravitated towards writing and visual learning. Sometime in middle school, I used to write commercials, like my own commercials. And at one point I thought I wanted to be an architect. And so that was a visual creative career. Actually, I don't know if I ever told you this. My mom's a nuclear chemist and my dad's an electrical engineer. And I was just the total opposite of that. Like I could do math, but I was like, I don't, I don't prefer it. And You know, science, I didn't prefer, but I always liked writing. I always liked storytelling. This makes so much sense to me. (laughs) There's an inner working, first of all, I would say a brain and intellectual capacity that you were around. I mean, you, your parents, the the fact that they did what they did in the world means that they were engaging the world at a high intellectual level. Yeah. And therefore purely by osmosis, (laughs) you you are sort of deconstructing and decoding the world. I mean, you're writing commercials at eight, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Part of you that has the freedom to make up, to create, to invent that's really, really freeing. Did, were they encouraging of your arts career or were they like, go be an engineer? Well, I mean, I think in the beginning, beginning, you know, Black parents, they don't see a lot of different career paths because they were like, you need to take care of yourself. Like you got to get out of this house. So you got to like work a job for, you know, work for somebody for 30 years and then you retire. And then, I mean, that's what they did. And that's what, My grandmother never went to college, you know, so it was like they were doing big things by going to college and going to grad school. My mom went to grad school and getting a good job, good government job. They both worked at a nuclear weapons plant. (laughs) And so like high level nuclear chemistry and engineering. Yeah. And that was their thing. And so when I finally said I want to work in television and film, they were like, you can't make money doing that like (laughs) and I was like no I I mean I don't care if I don't make money I just want to do it because at the time I didn't know yeah I didn't I had no no one in my world in Augusta Georgia growing up was in television like all they knew was like oh you could go work out at the tv news station that's a good job you know like pushing around a camera yeah oh yeah you would be able to do that I was like okay that's interesting but let me see if there's something else that is out there And between my junior and senior year, I like the research found this summer program was like, 
mom, dad, I want to do this. I was working, making, you know, a little bit of money to do the little things I was doing in high school. And I was like, can you guys just pay for this program? I really, really want to do it. And they were like, okay, yes. And it was a summer program at Northwestern in radio TV film. And I had the time of my life, like truly discovered what it is that people in film and television do. So we had a a TV portion that was live studio to tape, live to tape. We did a radio portion where it was audio, like you had to make everything happen. And then there was a film portion where we had a 16 millimeter film camera and you made a, a little short film. So I had so much fun. I was by myself in Chicago. I I still can't believe my parents drove me up there and I was 16. I was there for like three months and then they didn't even come get me. They were like, we're going to send you a plane ticket. I got on a plane by myself and went back to Augusta, Georgia. I can't even like, it was just a different time where you were like, I know my child is responsible enough to get where they're supposed to go, you know. I remember wearing the name tags on planes. Yeah, many yeah. Times, many times, many times. Yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's I know about the Northwestern program because my sister went through. I know so many people in our business who came through that program and it was a seminal moment for them as children, yep. right? But what yeah. I hear in your story was you were already problem solving. You were already curious. You were already kind of making something that was invisible to you. You said in Augusta, Georgia, there was no one, right? So that's invisible to you, but you are finding a way to make something visible because you have this this, this drive, right? And that's a core, I guess, part of who Shannon is and was. You then, I'm assuming, went to college and studied and did all the things. And then I guess, you know, one of the things we really, I like to talk about a lot this meld between what we learn in our professional lives and like how it informs our personal lives. So this sort of taking big risks and leaps, which is yeah. what you did. And I know yeah. sometimes in the creative arts, you say yes to something before you know you can do it. Oh, like I you have no, <laughs> you have no real world. There's no real world basis for you to know, oh, I can do this. And I yet as a creative professional, we often say yes to it. And there's that feeling that, you know, they say you're flying past your skis. It's like, oh gosh, you know, when is going to happen here? Right? Like in your first job, did you feel like, what have I done? Like I have manifested the job. I have it now, but can I do yeah. this? Can I do this? Yeah. I mean, I would say coming up through college, I did internships and stuff and they kind of, you know, take care of you and it's like you fail and it's kind of okay. And, but I feel like the first time I was like, oh, my imposter complex kicked in because I have that big time was when I was in college in my senior year. I knew I wanted to do editing. I did not know what was next. I had interned at like the PBS affiliate in DC and had gotten a job. And I had a job before I graduated at a post-production facility that did a lot of political ads because I was in Washington, DC. Political ads and Tom Life commercials. Those like the, you know, hits of the 70s, like stuff that's on at midnight and one o'clock in the morning. And I realized I definitely can't do that the rest of my life. So that's where I learned to use the Avid and all of that was like kind of a learning environment. So it never felt like, oh, I can't do this. And then my senior year, I had Bill Duke was our dean at Howard and he had gone to AFI as like a second career because he was an actor. He was in like Men's Society and Mm -hmm. Predator. And he had gone to AFI to be a director, which was in Los Angeles. I had only ever visited Los Angeles. And so I applied and I got in. And I think when I got to AFI that first week, I was like, oh my God, these people know so much more than I do about film history and film theory. And they went to fancy film schools and they talked the talk and knew so many people. Like one of my classmates was related to Frank Oz. And it was like, oh my God, I had to like look up who Frank Oz was, you know, like I was, I was so just in a world that I had never even been in, been close to. And I remember. Before we even got to AFI and started, we had a list of about 150 films 
that we had to watch and books we had to read. There was no streaming. There was no Netflix. Nothing was on the internet. There were no films on the internet. So I had to go to independent video stores, independent VHS rental places and find all of these movies. I almost got through that list, but I just remember being like, I'm so behind, (sighs) you know, like I'm so like, what, what have I been doing all my life? All of these people, you know, yeah, that's, that's what you think because you just don't grow up in an environment where that is encouraged, you know, like we went to movies, like my family loved the movies, but it was never something to study. It was never something to look up the great directors and great editors. That was a time when I was like, that's imposter complex. Cause you do, you do so well. Like I did well in high school. I did well in college, you know, honor society and all the things. And you think, oh, you know, I'm smart. I know so much. And then you get somewhere where you don't know. And I think that that's one of the sort of, at this stage of my life, I've come to appreciate the, I don't know moment Mm -hmm. and the, oh my goodness, Mm -hmm. what is about to unfold? What direction is this going to break in? (laughs) Is it been left? Is it going to been right? But in my early life, it was just sheer terror. It was like, because the unknown was so scary. And a lot of what our learnings or, you know, as we grow and as life does offer us all these different experiences, professionally and personally, getting comfortable with that unknown yeah. is a part of the work. I know it's the work in writing. I know it's certainly the work in living. When I was a caregiver, it was just, just hanging out in the unknown. Like I didn't yeah. know what was going to happen, right? Yeah. You get familiar with it. And then also as, you know, freelancers, we're not working the same job from the start of our career to retirement. So every job is unknown. Every job is a group of unknown people. It's an unknown genre sometimes. It's an unknown thing that you have to try and make into something. So now I talked about imposter complex and I super duper have it. It seems like, oh my God, you've been doing this for so many years. You've done too many shows. I literally get on every job and I was like, oh my God, every job. Oh my God, I, I'm not smart enough to do this. Like I'm not I, there. I'm going to be found out. They are going to discover that I don't know what I'm doing. And I talk my way into this job and I don't know how to do it. I um, say unequivocally, you do know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> because you were so brave to share that with us in that moment, because it's so common, you know, and people, Mm -hmm. I love it when people are really just open and on the table that I got got this thing that happens. Like I get the thing I ask for. Yeah. I go for the thing I ask for. Like I go hard for it. Yeah. I get it. And then I'm shaking in my boots because I'm like, what the hell is happening? Yeah. So the fact that you shared that with us, what are some of the rituals or practices that you do when you're in that, because clearly there is some way that you're moving through it. And maybe it's helpful when we hear from others, what works for them. Well, I, on my first scripted episodic job that I was editing, I had talked my way into it. I was working with a director and she was also on her like second show and she named it for me. Because it didn't have a name. And that's a lot of times too, you just think, oh, I go through this and this is just how I think about things. It's called imposter complex. And I'm like, oh my God, oh, I have this like affliction, (laughs) no, but whatever. And I was like, it's a thing. But that's a big deal too. When somebody names what you have, it gives you context. You have something that other people have had and other people have dealt with, right? And community, it gives you community. And community. And she was like, do you ever really fail at a job because I had done reality TV for 10 years and I had gone back to assisting and had done things that were unknown a lot. She was like, do you ever get on a job and do it and fail? Just totally mess it up to the point where people were like, she don't know what she's doing. And I was like, no, not really. No, no, I've never done that. I've never been fired off a job. And pretty much the stuff that I did, people like, we work together to make it something good. And she's like, well, then you're fine, right? (laughs) Then you got this, like you do it. And I was like, okay. My name is Angela Barnes. I always have her voice in the back of my head, like, 
you do know what you're doing and your ideas are sound and you listen to people and you work through whatever challenges there are. And so what I do, get on a job, no matter how, even like on from scratch. And I, you know, I just started something that I started kind of late on. I'm the type of person I want to know everything that I'm dealing with. Like, I don't want you to parse out information to me because then I feel like you're withholding something for some reason. And because I can't quite comprehend it or whatever, I'm like, no, give me everything I need to know. And then I'll figure out what's priority and what's big picture. I want big picture. And a lot of times they don't want to do that for editors for some odd reason. Just start at the beginning. All I can do is start with something small at the mm-hmm. beginning that you can do. Well, and then day by I, day you I, add. Yeah. What I love about that share and, and start at the beginning and start with something simple is that is applicable in one's professional life, but it is absolutely applicable in your personal life. I've known it in motherhood. I've known it. Oh, I've known it as a spouse. I've known it as a caregiver. That idea mm-hmm. of like, okay, well, this big experience is ahead of me. Where can I begin? And, you know, Annie Lamott, the writer, she calls it bird by bird, bit by bit. You just start. Mm -hmm. And and when I was writing, beginning to write the book from scratch, I said, well, I'm going to start where I know to begin, which is what's Mm -hmm. right here in front of me. And I'm going to write the best sentence I can today. Yeah. And then I'm going to put another sentence with it. And then I'll put another sentence with it. And hopefully at the end of the week, I'll have a chapter. But I want to go back just for a minute. You said her name is Angela Barnes. Because we're on the Lifted podcast and a lot of what this conversation is about is about these moments of lift, right? When we're Mm -hmm. going along in life and it's like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen. I can't see two feet in front of me. Mm -hmm. Or I'm at a state of impossibility. Like this is not going to happen. And there's someone or something that comes into one's life that I say lifts you, moves you to the next place. And so Angela sounds like she was someone who lifted you. She lifted your awareness of a key part of who you were that allowed you to go forward professionally, right? So shout out to Angela. (laughs) I like to ask of creative people, what do you do for play? And how does it inform your work? I wish it was something physical and outside, but I love watching movies. I love watching something and forgetting that I'm an editor that critiques things and pulls the things apart and makes things better. Like I love that show or that film where I'm like, oh, I'm just sitting back and watching this. I'm not trying to figure out how it could be better. I moved out here and school was so stressful. And I was working, I used to go to these dance classes and I used to drag myself because I was like, oh, I don't want to, I'm so tired. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything physical. And I was always glad that I went because yes. that dancing to me was such an emotional expression. I always did lyrical classes and music was always really great or touched something. It was just an emotional expression and it was something that you would do in a way that no one else would do. You were always encouraged to like find your expression in this particular choreography. And then yoga now has kind of replaced that. And it's the kind of the same thing where like I drag myself to a yoga class, but like just breathing and stretching and, you know, I do a lot of vinyasa. So it's, it. And I guess that's play. No, it is play. It absolutely, it absolutely is. I play with my children. Sometimes like, I know I don't want to play. I don't want to play. I'm tired. I don't want to play. But when you do sit on the floor and play, and then you hear what they say, and it always makes me laugh. And we went to dinner the other night in Santa Monica and we walked over to the pier and then we were walking back and I have a three-year-old son and he heard music coming out of a restaurant and he was just like, let me dance. Can I dance? I'm going to dance. I'm going to dance. And he just started dancing like right on the sidewalk. And I was like, okay, let's do dance break. We <laughs> So then we'd go a few steps and he'd be like, dance break, you dance again. Well, this is that spontaneous joy and that spontaneous yeah. movement. 
I remember when I was intermittently employed actress <laughs> in Hollywood <laughs> with an ill husband at home. I wasn't a mother yet. And I was like, life feels insane right now. Mm-hmm. And oh, someone said, yeah. you should take a dance class. And so I went to Santa Monica mm. and I took a belly dancing class. That shifted so much energy for me week to week and opened up something in me, tapped into a different part of my brain. I would imagine for you creatively, when you get to a point in the edit or in in editing where you're stuck because you have Mm -hmm. to look at things, you look at the same material over and 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 over again Mm -hmm. and some more, Mm -hmm. but you have to see it differently every time. Mm-hmm. Like you have yeah. to always find something new in something that's the same. And yeah. so the exercise of doing that, if you ever get stuck, do you stop and take a dance break? Do you like, when you're like, I see nothing new in this. This is the same old stuff. I have no new take. Yeah. Do you it's, stop it's, and dance? What do you do? It's always good to to step away from whatever it is that is getting. I mean, I have a unique persistence level that is like very high. Are you dogged? To a fault, yes. And also have this thing where I have trouble disengaging. Like I'll have somewhere I need to be. Like I need to step away from whatever I'm doing to get to the next thing. And I have trouble disengaging because I want to finish it. If I start something and I sit down and do it, I want to finish it because I'm there, right there at that point. I want to get it finished. And a lot of times that's just not possible to finish. You know, like you sit down to write a novel, you're not going to finish it that day. But I'm like, maybe I could, if I was persistent enough, maybe I could just get through it, get through one more chapter. So my inability to disengage, I'm aware of that. And I set timers or else I'll be late for everything. I have to set timers. But I also started using an Oculus. We have young children. So I wasn't, I'm not going to the gym, still not going to the gym yet. So I got an Oculus and there's a workout program that I like to do. I can do 15 minutes of workout and I really like it. That has replaced actual dance classes or yoga classes or Pilates, like all the things that you kind of had to like really set aside some time in the day because you have to get dressed, get there, do that. So I love that approach because what I hear in that is that these small moments, these small breaks net a larger goal. Like they net something bigger. And, you know, people often say, you know, there's that time, it seems to go in and out of favor, but people say, you know, the small is big, you know, these sort of, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there's truth in that, right? There's truth in that small actions and that small actions of joy, small actions of kindness, small actions have big reverberating effects. So I am one of those people who suffers from, if it didn't look a prescribed way, if it's not a 90 minute yoga class, then I've Mm. done nothing, right? Which Uh, is not true, right? Like it had to have all of this sort of structure and space around it. And what I've come to understand is that, oh, 15 minutes gets me somewhere. Oh, I thought as a new writer, I had to sit down and like write for eight straight hours in order to legitimately be a writer. What I learned is that you can write in spurts. Like I would write 30 minutes, take a break, go do something, come back, add another 30, add a 15 to it a little bit later in the day. And at the end of the day, I had three hours of writing. And And sometimes it might be a three hour stretch. I like sharing that because I think people hear from that, that there isn't any one approach and follow your intuition. Please yeah. follow your intuition creatively, but also in your personal life. If something yeah. is saying, back away for a minute, give yourself grace and space, take it. Yeah. And do what you can at the time. And so, do what you can at the time. I think having children is teaches you that. <laughs> like, was, uh, you yeah. can only do what you can at the time. So that is a part of perspective, right? I was wondering how motherhood and being a mother and the perspective, right, that, that shift in perspective has informed your work. Would you say it has? Absolutely. Just in terms of like scheduling, I feel like I'm a hundred times more efficient because you have this whole life outside of work. And, you know, not that you don't when you don't have children, you absolutely do. But children dictate a lot of your life when you have them. I'm so much more efficient 
I'm a serious multitasker. Like sometimes when I'm like, you only do one thing at once, what are you doing? You know, like, aren't you like, oh no, 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 that's just me because that's who I am. But multitasking and organizing things, but even to the point to where letting go too, mm. sometimes of like the house, my house is messy all the time. I always joke during the pandemic when we were all home all day long every day of the week our kitchen counter it looks like the zombie apocalypse happened and the people just left the house they were like they left the house and all the looters have come in and they just pulled stuff out the cabinets and everything's on the counter and you know groups of people have come through and messed up this place and these poor owners they done left the house they're dead somewhere they've been eating my zombies but i had to let go like we were in a pandemic unknown times for everyone in the world that was the part of too is like organizing what you can so i tend to like organize, organize, organize a lot at work yes. because I have to let that go in a sense at home. In your personal life. So there's that. Yeah. Balance. I would, I was, yeah, yeah. I, I can see that because I've watched you work and I see the hyper focus and the hyper attention to detail. And I simply don't know how one could be in that headspace for eight, All nine hours. And then you also can't. give equal discerning attention to detail to what kind of mustard you've got in your fridge. You, you would go insane. You can't. You can't. You can't. And the decision fatigue. And so your brain is taxed. I remember that as a caregiver, but at the end of the day, I would be so fatigued having made all these decisions that then some things you would have to yes. truly like to let go. Since we've talked about your kids and we've talked about your work, what do you hope your kids will take away from watching their mom do this work in the world? I have a mentor. Her name is Pam Martin. She was just nominated for an Oscar for King Richard. She's a brilliant editor, but also the mom icon, like the working mom icon to me, because she was an editor with young children and always gave boundaries. When she had her kids, she was like, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not doing that. And she asked for things. She got them. And she just made her own work-life balance and you have to do it for yourself. In this industry, no one's going to say, oh, you don't have to get that cut done. They're going to be like, no, we have a deadline. So you're going to like stay late, right? She made her own boundaries, set all that stuff up very early on when she went back to work after having kids. That is my mom icon. She had somebody tell her that it's good for your children to see you go to work every day. It's good for them to see that you have to put yourself into something that you said you were going to do because then they learn that, oh, I need to be dependable. I need to be independent. I need to organize my own schedule for myself and organize my day for myself. And creatively, I'm still blown away when I see stuff that I've worked on to this day in a theater or on air or on a streaming platform. And my daughter is starting to be like, Oh, you worked on that, especially working from home. Like, oh, you were on there and it became on the TV. And then they understand that TV, Netflix, they go out into the world. And people talk about it. And people talk about it. And it's something. And, you know, when I cut the photograph, there was a billboard, a huge billboard across the street from her school. And that was just like, oh, my mommy worked on that movie. And then it, so that still makes me very proud. And pride is a big part of that. It's being proud of something that you've done. Exactly. There is a great value in that mm -hmm. and modeling that for our kids, that sense of stewardship and ownership. As we round out, I want to talk just a little bit about from scratch. Yes. Um, specifically, I wanted to talk with you about episode 106. Yes. And so it's that theme of when Amy becomes a new mom. To some degree, yes. we've been talking about that, right? Yeah. And I hope with that episode, a lot of people can relate to that struggle of that work life balance, right? And we've been talking a little bit about that. Yeah. Did that resonate with you when you watched that? I know you didn't edit, oh, you didn't edit as, that, that episode, but you went in watching I the did series. watch. I yeah. cried, cried through the, mm -hmm. the last half of the season. Yeah, absolutely. It's just no matter how 
your children come to you, it is a adjustment. And I remember having a child and leaving the hospital and I was like, oh, they're just going to like give it to us and yeah, give this little baby to us and let us go. And like, nobody's going to come with us and make sure we do things right. And, and I remember like thinking when we got home, like, okay, dumber people than us have raised children. We can figure this out. They give dumb people babies all the time. And I don't think we're dumb. So I think we can figure it out. But that's just, that is what it is. It's just a learning process. And there's so many emotions from scratch is really good about tapping into every kind of emotion. And there's so many emotions when you have, first of all, there's lots of hormones involved, right? Postpartum. Mm -hmm. But I just remember being like, I am the happiest I've ever been in my life. And then Savannah wouldn't lash and be like, oh my God, this is the worst moment of my life. So it's like very highs and lows. Yeah. And riding that and, and realizing that lots of mothers go through it. Lots of mothers go through very different things and lots of mothers go through the same thing. And, and I think that what Amy was going through just resonates because we all go through it or we all go through something. You are not alone. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it feels like it when you're up at like three o'clock in the morning and it's just you and this baby and you're like, oh my God, this, this I'm alone. <laughs> Everyone in the world is like figuring their shit out. And I, and I'm the only one that's like, ah. yeah. and we're never alone. That's one of the things I hope yeah. this, this series does communicate or give people that glimpse that they're not alone. So my, my last question for you today is, is there anything from working on our show mm-hmm. that you will take with you for the rest? I know with every time I have a job, there's something that I take for <sighs> the relationships that I know for real, like I am so happy. I had worked with Brian Raver before and he brought me on and meeting you and Attica. And there's always a sense of when you work on a show, there's always a sense that you want to make the show the best it can be because my name is on it. I want to do that. But I really like on this show, my biggest thing was to help you all. I wanted it to show to be the best it could be because your names were on it. And it was your first show that you were show running. And I want this to be the beginning of something really good for them, you know? And so it's, it's just the truth. Like I'm not like sucking up, but that no. was, I really felt that way. Like it was just a long process and, you know, making any first season show is always a long, arduous process with a lot of turns and a lot of things. And, and I just was like, we going to get through this. Like I'm going to help them get through this. <laughs> and as much as I can, you know, like it always stops at some point. We felt that love, felt that act of service to us and to the story. And what was beautiful about being on the receiving end of that was that's really what we were intending to do with the whole series, that it mm-hmm. be an act of love and an act of service. So the fact that it's that way for you and that our work can be that. We can yeah. we use our work and employ our gifts and our talents towards something that is helpful to others. This has been a delightful conversation. <laughs> it, yes, oh, it God. has. Oh my gosh. And I'm going to always take from this conversation that aspect of making the invisible visible and that mm-hmm. piece of curiosity around how can I lift a particular moment? How can I lift someone else? How can I do the thing I didn't know I could do or that Mm -hmm. I thought I couldn't do or that there was no blueprint to do? You are living embodiment of that. So thank you so much for this conversation. You're welcome. Thank you. Shannon's reflections on how one art form such as dance can inform another art form editing was absolutely inspiring and something I will never forget. Lifted is developed, written, and produced by me and my one-woman producing team, Solia Cates. It is edited by Jamie Moss. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for our next inspiring episode.